Studies. Uh, this is Guelph Museum's third and final military lecture of 2020. Uh, tonight's talk is by Dr. Alex Sushin, uh, and he'll be talking for about 45 minutes tonight. Uh, and there'll be time at the end for uh, Alex to answer some questions too. Uh, and if you do have questions, uh, please send it in through the chat function uh, on this webpage and we'll and send the message out to everyone. Um, we're still relatively new at hosting our military lectures virtually um, on the WebEx platform, and we're gonna do our best to keep everything flowing smoothly. Uh, if you do have any technical difficulties and you cannot resolve the issue on your own, uh, please know that the session is being recorded uh, and the recording will be made available on the museum's website and on our social platforms. Uh, everyone at this presentation is welcome to simply listen in, or you can use the chat window to send in questions and comments. Uh, Luke, Luke Stempian here at the museum will be monitoring the chat window and Alex will be ha happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. If you're interested in purchasing Alex's book, uh, War Junk, Munitions Disposal, Post-War Reconstruction in Canada, uh, we have arranged a 20% discount for participants in this lecture uh, through um, B BC uh, Press. Um, and there'll be a special discount code that you'll be able to see at the end of the presentation. Uh, and that'll be seen on our chat area in the closing screen. Uh, before we begin, we need to recognize that our First Nations have participated in all of Canada's major military conflicts. And during the Second World War, they were involved in every service and every theater of the conflict that Canada participated in. Uh, we are also uh, need to acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, through the Between the Lakes Purchase Number no. Three Treaty of 1792. The Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over three million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, and we must do more to learn, share, and support truth and healing. Uh, Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge and relationships about the land, its history, and its peoples. This commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Alex Sushin is a historian specializing in warfare society and the environment in Canada. He received his PhD from the University of Western Ontario and uh, held uh, Social Sciences, Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada postdoctoral fellowship uh, at the Laurier Centre for Military, Strategic and Disarmament Studies. He currently holds an Associated Medical Services postdoctoral doctoral fellowship at Trent University's Frost Centre for Canadian and Indigenous Studies. Alice, Alex has worked at uh, the Laurier Military Centre for two years as a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, his most recent papers are Under Fathoms of Salt Water, Canada's Ammunition Dumping Program, 1944 to 1947, and Something Fishy, which is in the Canadian Military History Journal. Uh, Alex's interest in the history of munitions disposal stems from a larger curiosity about the relationship between disposability, material culture, and the environment. So I'd like to thank Alex for joining us tonight, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. So I'll turn it over to you, Alex. Thank you very much. And it's great to be back in the, at the Guelph Museum, even if it's virtually. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Thank you. And I'm just going to share my screen here. All right, are we good? Perfect. Good. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking you all for attending my talk tonight. And I'd especially like to thank Ken, uh, Luke, and Val, and everybody else at the Guelph uh, Museums uh, for giving me the opportunity to launch my book. War Junk, Munitions Disposal, and Post-War Reconstruction in Canada. It's really hard to believe that it's been 10 years in the making. So I hope that uh, you'll all enjoy reading the book as much as I enjoyed writing it. And for those that are interested in buying a copy, as uh, Ken mentioned, that you're in luck that the paperback edition is now available. And I might be a little biased, but I think it would make an excellent uh, gift this holiday season, and especially because uh, my publisher, UBC Press, has agreed to a discount code that will be uh, special to this event. And so if you hang around till the end, uh, you'll get a 20% off discount code uh, that you can use uh, directly on UBC Press's uh, site, and it'll give you 20% off the paperback price. And so many thanks to UBC Press for putting that together. And I'll also, uh, in the context of this talk, uh, more specifically, 
I'll also be presenting a little bit more about uh, the research that I've been working on since I finished uh, War Junk. Uh, and uh, I started this work a little bit uh, while I was at Laurier and, and uh, Trent and, and RMC. Uh, and the new project is entitled Weapons of Mass Pollution, Health and Environmental Hazards in Canada's Munitions Industry. Uh, but tonight, uh, I'd like to accomplish three objectives uh, in my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce you all to the history of munitions disposal and its connections to post-war reconstruction and rehabilitation in Canada after the Second World War. The goal here is to demonstrate the importance of military surpluses and get you to reconsider some of the value regimes defining our conceptions of garbage and waste. The second objective is to explore the dark side of munitions disposal and discuss the lingering health and environmental hazards, as well as some of the failures and problems involved in Canada's disposal program. And finally, the last objective is to write myself into this story and profile how the book evolved over the last decade. Uh, maybe I'm just a huge book nerd, but I always find it really fascinating to hear about the author's background and how the, the, the project came together over so much time. So I thought I'd fill you all in on uh, some elements of my own writing journey. And to start that journey, we need to go back all the way to August of 2012, when I was standing in front of a chicken statue and my entire PhD dissertation started making sense. A year removed from the hell of comprehensive exams, I had been in the throes of archival research in Ottawa since May, but I had found the time to travel to England, uh, where I happened to visit Leeds and tour the Royal Armouries Museum. Now, at the time, I had never heard of the Royal Armouries, but I can tell you it was an awesome, awesome experience. Its impressive artifact collection spans every conceivable type of armament from almost every century of British history, and it even hosts a live jousting match outside on a specially made jousting pit. And certainly that jousting tournament would have been the highlight of the trip had I not stumbled across this chicken statue. It's called Bird That Wants to Survive, and I found it tucked away in a small exhibit entitled Farewell to Arms, the only part of the armories devoted to peace. And this chicken statue stopped me dead in my tracks, and I even let out this big gasp as I read the description. And so leave it to a military historian in a room full of guns and swords and armor and bombs from every century of human history to be literally blown away by a chicken. So what's up with this chicken? Why should we care? Well, there's two points that clarify its significance, so bear with me for a moment. The first point has to do with the context surrounding the early part of my research. Before my trip to England, I had spent the better part of four months researching at the Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa. And at the time, I was mainly researching on a hunch, which in basic terms was a question about the objects of war. Were objects, much like veterans, rehabilitated when the Second World War ended? Several hypotheses and starting points had solidified my initial curiosity. For instance, I quickly realized that the objects of war don't just simply disappear when the shooting stops. So it was obvious from the start that they outlived the state of war and somehow survived in peacetime. This in turn meant that the objects continued occupying a physical space thereby posing a logistical dilemma for demobilizing militaries and bureaucracies, while any changes to an object's form and function had to be imposed on, an, on the asset by different custodians and value regimes over time. And finally, I also recognized that an object's lifespan and transition into peaceful purposes might not easily fit into the tr war's traditional periodization. After all, an object could be rehabilitated, into new uses or completely destroyed years after 1945. And although these starting points had provided some fodder to test against the archival grain, in 2012, the full scope of my inquiry and interest remained elusive and unclear. The second point that clarifies this uh, significance of this chicken statue has less to do with the fact that it's a chicken and more to do with what it's made out of. This chicken is made out of scrapped AK-47s that were exchanged in a Guns for Tools program organized by the Christian Council of Mozambique to help end the civil war that had been raging there in the 1980s. After collecting the weapons, the Christian Council gave them to local artists who turned them into a, a sculptures and art uh, for an exhibition in London. If you Google Arms into Art Mozambique, you'll find an amazing assortment of art and sculptures that are all made from surplus weapons. 
So although this statue has nothing to do with my research interests on the disposal of Canada's munitions and supplies in the 1940s, it was probably the most important discovery that I made during my PhD. In light of all my archival work that summer and all the questions I had swirling around in my head, this chicken was the first artifact that I saw that had proved my research hunch correct. This was my aha moment. Objects transition between war and peace and in doing so, they maintain profound political, economic, social, and environmental significance. In the case of Canada's Second World War experience, the government and military reversed wartime logistics to ensure that the flood of military surpluses would support and not hinder post-war reconstruction and rehabilitation. And as I argue in my book, Canada had a disposal strategy that was shaped by public pressure business interests, political imperatives, and the prevailing economic landscape. Its goals were to facilitate an object's conversion into peacetime uses in order to support political authority, public safety, economic stability. In the end, thrifty Canadians took full advantage by reusing and recycling surplus munitions and supplies to improve their living standards during a turbulent post-war transition. In that sense, munitions disposal was a crucially important part of demobilization, but it also had a dark side, rife with acrimony over prices and depreciating assets, while decontamination and cleanup efforts were hamstrung by shortened timelines, budgetary constraints, which inevitably caused significant environmental degradation. In forming this argument, I borrowed some insights from other fields, like discard studies and the history of technology. In particular, I found the book by David Egerton, The Shock of the Old, to be very instructive and influential since he explored the history of technology and argued that modernity has created this cultural emphasis in our society, which ignores the usage and significance of old technologies. In the book, Egerton makes a convincing case against the linear conception of technological progress in which we define progress as a series of new inventions replacing or improving upon the old ones. So think of the iPhone 8 becoming the iPhone 9, becoming the iPhone 10. And as Egerton shows, such a paradigm is great for marketing, but it's not really representative of the actual usage of technologies. Sometimes we don't acquire that new piece of technology right away because we like the old one better, or we can't afford the more expensive newer model. Other times, new inventions only become useful decades after being invented, or when combined with another technology to create a more useful hybrid. And this persistent survival of old things and their adaptations into new forms and functions is an important theme in my book, and I'll return to it in a second. But for the time being, think of that old iPhone you just got rid of uh, getting reused secondhand by someone or broken up for spare parts. Old things can survive within this dual uh, context of thriftiness and disassembly because these actions unlock different forms of value. Following the Second World War, the Canadian government, much like every other allied nation, oversaw a disposal program that was designed to promote thriftiness and disassembly precisely because those actions used up leftover military assets during a period of severe material shortages. To thrifty consumers and entrepreneurs, weapon systems are just that, networks of objects working together to create an output, meaning that the parts and components forming the sum could be more valuable than the whole. Since wartime controls over resources and production had curtailed the availability of new civilian goods immediately following the war, you can start to see the added value of reclamation. Sometimes the only source of goods and parts was the government's inventory. Therefore, munitions, uh, munitions disposal and especially military surpluses were reused and recycled into new purposes. This is one of the most important transitions to occur during the end of war. And I mean, just think back to that chicken statue and what it represents. Guns not killing people anymore. Now, I think this topic and argument might seem a little unconventional at first, but I think uh, the, they're actually a fairly obvious one to make. I mean, who really thinks that all the uh, unneeded machine guns suddenly vanished when the Nazis uh, surrendered? And hopefully no one does. But if you read any history of the war, you might actually get that impression because most of the counts end when the fighting stops. 
And of the few that push past that 1945 bookend, most will only cover human topics like veterans rehabilitation. And so I suppose therein lies some of my book's originality. Most people don't spend time thinking about the post-war lives of military assets or the longevity of product life cycles or how and why we discard things that we no longer require. Today, the appetite for new stuff often means that our concerns and priorities are conditioned by acquiring new things and new technologies, even if the old ones are still useful. And as Giles Slade argues in his incredible book, Made to Break, this is a consequence of living in a world dominated by planned obsolescence. It's affected how we think about our possessions, how we devalue our garbage, and it's dulled curiosity for how disposal works and affects our lifestyles. Today, we are inundated with such a diverse material opulence grounded in vast inventories of cheap disposable products. As a result, we tend to take the material world surrounding us for granted. But this was a luxury that few people in the 1940s could afford. Think about this for a second. Today, every American citizen is destined to generate 102 tons of garbage over the course of their lifetimes. And there are some indications that Canadians are more wasteful for instance, in 2008, we discarded an average of 777 kilograms of solid municipal waste per person that year. In 2012, the average dropped to 720 kilograms per person, but we still generated a whopping 33.4 million metric tons of waste, and about 25 million of that total were sent to landfills or incinerated and not recycled. We count our pennies. We count our calories and we count our blessings, but few of us ever count our garbage. Yet that trash we create has a life cycle that lasts long after it leaves our possession. It therefore maintains a political, economic, social, and environmental significance, just like the war junk from the 1940s. And given the omnipotence of today's extreme wastefulness, it is really quite refreshing to research and write about how thrifty Canadians uh, were with the war's material leftovers. And I must admit that this book has prompted me to reevaluate my own wastefulness and make some attempts to curb my own consumption habits. After all, I would prefer that a 102 ton monument of things Alex threw away not be my greatest and most lasting lifetime achievement. Unfortunately, it likely will be. What we throw away can tell us a great deal about ourselves as individuals, as communities, and as a civilization. And similarly, I argue how we throw things away can offer insights into past priorities and strategic considerations as people make decisions between opportunity costs. Therefore, within the context of Canada's Second World War experience, the subject of munitions disposal is more than just a military history topic. It's a topic that cuts across many different disciplines and subfields because the term disposal is defined as a two-way process of relinquishment and acquisition in which one party considers an object unneeded and transfers it to another party through a transaction or trade. Trash for some was treasure for others. So munitions disposal is not just tied to military affairs, disarmament or demobilization. Rather, it's a story about the material world underpinning the transition between total war and peace. And it's also a story about how the suddenly unneeded objects transition between different forms, functions, uses and value regimes to impact post-war developments. So let's take a look at that impact more closely now. The story of how Canada disposed of its military surpluses starts with wartime productivity. No one in 1939 was talking about getting rid of weapons and equipment. Not only was this counterproductive to winning the war, but the weaponry available to Canada's military was exceedingly small. That situation changed dramatically following the Allied defeats at Dunkirk and Pearl Harbor and Singapore. In response, the Canadian government formed the Department of Munitions and Supply, or DMS, to control, regulate, and fund the production of war materials for both the nation's armed forces and those of its allies. From 1940 to 1945, the DMS spent billions of public money procuring mountains of munitions and supplies, ranging from bed frames to boots and typewriters to tanks, and I've posted some statistics here on the slide to give you a sense of the scale. And looking at them more closely, I find it very hard to fathom Canada as any sort of peaceable kingdom anymore. I mean, we produced 144,000 tons of TNT in less than six years. And if we were to put all that TNT in one spot and blow it up, the total blast yield would have been equal to about eight 
Hiroshima-sized atomic detonations. Now, this surge in all-out production was not unique to Canada. It was replicated in other countries because the Allied armies required a seemingly infinite assortment of weapons and equipment to defeat Germany and Japan. However, while this output was a wartime necessity, Allied victory in 1945 caused major industrial and logistical dislocations. The war's end triggered a global disposal crisis. Without an enemy to fight, all this procurement was well in excess of post-war requirements. So what happened to it all? What, how did the government divest its surplus assets? And these questions are actually incredibly important because in winning the war, the Allies had overproduced, which meant that the post-war economy was under serious threat. Many people, especially business executives and public officials, were terrified about the deflationary economic conditions that would arise if an uncontrolled flood of government-owned surpluses entered the marketplace. This was threatening, not only because the cost of production had already been paid out during the war, but also because it would force the post-war economy into competing against the vestiges of wartime production. Therefore, a flood of cheaper, second-hand goods would undercut the demand for future products and over the long term, lower prices for new goods, employment and profits. Fears of deflation were widespread and transnational and they owed their origins to demobilization after the First World War. Looking back on these experiences in 1919 and 1920, when sales of government surpluses were largely unregulated and speculators had profited, officials in Canada, Britain and the United States saw only failures and mistakes. In those countries, there was particular hatred for the speculator or someone who buys large stocks of goods on the assumption they'd make profits on resale, but who has no stake in the industries concerned. In the 1940s, speculators were blamed for the deflation that preceded the Great Depression, and it became a rallying cry of sorts for policymaking in, in the Second World War. And I think the quote up there on the slide by John Barry really demonstrates that point. Barry was president of the War Assets Corporation, or WAC, which was the crown company set up to address Canada's disposal problem. And it's also the institution that my book examines in detail. The false boom and subsequent evils that he is referring to are most definitely the Roaring Twenties and the Dirty Thirties. Now, at the same time, not everyone was so fearful of deflation and economic turmoil. And in fact, there were many social interest groups, municipal and provincial governments that saw the impending liquidation of federal property as a valuable opportunity. Like businesses, they favored increasing government regulations to control disposal. But instead of destroying everything like some business associations were demanding, they wanted surpluses redeployed to improve living conditions, ease housing shortages and improve other social welfare programs. And therefore, the disposal of munitions and supplies became entwined within uh, the expanding obligations of the social welfare state and social security. So if the state was going to fulfill these expanding obligations for its citizens and its veterans, then it needed to maintain big government services by keeping all its assets and property. And in that sense, Canada's disposal strategy was going to have to steer a fine line between supporting economic recovery for private enterprise and the state's expanding social welfare obligations. So if you haven't noticed yet, the disposal problem was a pretty complex issue. And that's why the WAC was established in November of 1943. The WAC was responsible for planning and implementing a disposal strategy in addition to handling all the physical aspects of disposal, including collection, appraisal, storage, maintenance, sales, and destruction. Despite some public criticism and controversy, the WAC's operations became a crucial pillar of the post-war transition because it successfully reversed wartime logistics and also encouraged Canadians to reuse and recycle leftover munitions and supplies. And although, although the concept of reverse logistics was coined later in the 20th century, I think officials in the WAC would have understood its meaning. Reverse logistics is defined as the process of moving goods back from the point of consumption to the point of origin for the purposes of recapturing value or initiating proper disposal. And if uh, the concept is still unclear to you, the best example of reverse logistics I can offer is the act of returning your empty alcohol bottles to the beer store. So how did the WAC reverse wartime logistics without deflating the post-war economy 
Well, in short, the WAC positioned itself as a wholesale distributor and adopted restrictive selling policies to prohibit direct sales to the public. Only verified businesses, public institutions, and social welfare groups could make purchases, thereby cutting out speculators. Basically, Barry designed the WAC's operations to buttress legitimate trade networks by recirculating goods back through the industries that had just produced them. Now, this policy caused significant acrimony and confusion amongst Canadians who expected to make direct purchases from the WAC at discounted prices. But that type of open access retail network that people expected was precisely what Barry was trying to avoid because that would promote speculation and price deflation. The complaints about access and prices appearing in the media sullied the WAC's reputation as people were unhappy about having to buy surplus goods through regular channels and often at marked up prices. But the WAC's system of reverse logistics was designed to achieve larger structural objectives within the economy that were not always evident when Canadians opened their wallets to pay more for things during a turbulent post-war transition characterized by severe material shortages. The main goal here was always to maintain economic stability. So the WAC's reverse logistics proved to be very profitable for pre-existing or established businesses because it supported the status quo. For example, established shipping companies had first dibs on leftover cargo vessels and used those purchases to expand operations, while many of the boats remained in service until the 1960s. The automotive industry also profited handsomely when companies bought back vehicles, equipment, and raw materials. Not only did these types of purchases fuel future production, but they also limited the supply of spare parts to licensed dealers, which perhaps forced people to buy new cars instead of using the black market to fix up the old one. So in that larger structural sense, the government's disposal strategy is controlling the levers of repetitive consumption while also buffering gaps in production, stocking shelves, supporting brand loyalty, and using established trade networks to recondition military pattern kit according to civilian safety standards, markets, and preferences. And furthermore, social welfare organizations, public institutions, and local governments received special provisions for acquiring goods. Before anything was sold to businesses, these institutions were invited to submit priority requests, and if the goods were available, then the WAC sold them directly. In doing so, the WAC was able to redistribute items that were urgently needed for the post-war transition. Hospitals and relief organizations benefited tremendously, but it was universities and vocational institutions that uh, probably benefited the most. These educational institutions were under extreme pressure to both house and teach thousands of new student veterans attending classes through the rehabilitation benefits. As a result, they purchased long lists of items and property, like those huts from UBC up in the top right of the slide. Additionally, provisions were also put in place for so the state could strategically divest assets according to its self-interests. Consequently, leftover kit was sold either as military aid to other allies, like the Dutch, who then reused the weapons to fight colonial revolutionaries in Indonesia, or it was sold as aid to police forces, which hints at a long and concerning history of police militarization. Now, reusing military surpluses to, to fulfill their primary and intended functions was always the most desired and most valuable outcome. But we also have to remember that there were many types of munitions that could not make that tactical to practical transition. And in fact, there were many things that retained value only if they were disassembled or significantly renovated. And the best example of this process that I can show you here involves surplus aircraft. And since there were severe material shortages in post-war Canada, many people had to make do and get creative with second choices and the fact that aircraft were composed of thousands of different parts and technologies made them extremely versatile. In one case, an Air Force veteran near Hamilton, Ontario, bought seven Ventura bombers and turned them into tourist cabins by cutting off the wings, 
and renovating the insides. I'm not sure how long he stayed in business, but he ingeniously bypassed the shortages in building materials by upcycling old airframes to expand his gas station business. And this thriftiness was not an isolated case. And in fact, the term barnyard bomber became synonymous with surplus aircraft in Western Canada because farmers eagerly bought them to cannibalize for parts like these Lancaster bombers here in Alberta. So understanding how the war's materiality was discarded and transformed really helps illuminate the profound legacies of militarization and demobilization in Canadian society. And if I've piqued your curiosity, my book discusses these subjects in far more detail than I can provide here. Now, up to this point, the story has been generally positive and productive, but the history of munitions disposal also has its dark side. And in fact, there are some really ominous and disconcerting legacies for the environment and public health more generally, which I've been researching more closely since I finished my PhD in 2016. And in particular, I've been focusing on the steep environmental costs of ordnance destruction in relationship to ocean pollution. When the Second World War ended, one of the most concerning commodity chains related to ammunition, explosives, and chemical weapons. Ammunition production had been colossal. And even though large portions were expended in battle or needed by the post-war military, there were still substantial leftovers. I mean, the United States produced something like 41 billion rounds of ammunition and artillery shells. The British uh, produced 11 billion and Canada added another 4.6 billion adding in artillery shells. And these types of assets posed a serious challenge to post-war political authority, public safety, and they also represented a continuing financial and storage burden for demobilizing militaries. Additionally, the mountains of captured enemy ordnance threatened occupational security, while the war's destruction in Europe and Asia further complicated the transportation and logistical situations. And at the time, there were only four destruction methods available. Incineration, controlled detonations, scrapping, and ocean dumping. For a variety of reasons and limitations, none of these methods could handle the entire volume of leftovers alone, so they were all used whenever feasible and sometimes in conjunction with each other. Open air burning or incineration was used frequently, especially to destroy enemy weapon systems like those Japanese combat aircraft in the bottom left of the slide. Okay, But as you can imagine, burning explosives or chemical weapons created toxic smoke, which endangered technicians and prompted public complaints about air and soil pollution. Sometimes it even forced military authorities to evacuate entire cities and towns. So you can see that incineration had some challenges, even if it was the cheapest and most straightforward destruction method available. And unfortunately, it is still used today, as evidenced by the picture at the bottom right of the American soldier uh, burning uh, uh, items in an open pit. Controlled detonations also occurred frequently. Perhaps the most famous instance was the British Bang at Heligoland Island in the North Sea. In April of 1947, the Royal Navy placed 6,800 tons of explosives inside the German submarine pens on the island, and the resulting explosion was one of the largest non-nuclear detonations in history up to that point in time. Aside from obliterating the landscape and ecology, logistics were a critical limiting factor here. You needed a large transportation network to move the ordnance safely and a space to store it beforehand. And of course, you also needed empty space so the blast yield wouldn't level nearby communities. And just look at that video up there in, of Heligoland Island and realize that isn't an atomic weapon. It's just a measly 6,800 tons of high explosives going off in one shot in some remote corner of the world. However, there were millions of tons of surplus ammunition left over after the war ended. The British Army alone counted 1.2 million tons surplus just in the United Kingdom. Scrapping was by far the most desired disposal method because it salvaged metals and other materials that could be resold. In all allied countries, breaking down shells for their metal components and fertilizers 
was viewed as a responsible and noteworthy course of public policy by not only politicians, but also the public alike. However, the key limiting factors here were capacity, cost, and the safety of technicians. In Canada, many explosives factories were shutting down in 1945 and 1946, so there were fewer places that had the capacity to boil explosive compounds out of shells and melt down the casing safely and profitably. Moreover, there were also some serious incumbent risks to scrapping as well, not only for technicians performing the work, but also for the environment, since the unprofitable and dangerous remainders still had to be disposed of nearby, and that precipitated a tremendous amount of pollution and contamination at those locations. And so that leaves us with only one other method, dumping. At the time, the oceans were seen as the miracle solution for the logistics of demobilization. The Allies had the available ships, the ocean floor was remote and isolated, the water acted as a security perimeter, bulk quantities could be disposed of quickly, and as long as the weather cooperated, dumping could continue without interruption and far away from prying eyes. And in fact, to contemporaries, dumping even appeared to lessen the environmental impact by comparison to land-based uh, uh, destruction because the water diluted substances and materials. And as other scholars have shown for much of recorded history, the dumping of garbage, sewage, and industrial effluence was commonplace. And this value and uh, this attitude was uh, shaped and based on scientific facts about dilution and the idea of threshold values, meaning that there was a permissible amount of pollution and toxic waste that could be injected into water without affecting human health and marine environments. Now, dilution is a fact. It can mitigate contamination of some types of toxic substances, but there was also significant debates about the accuracy of thresholds and the dilution capacities, while policymakers tended to favor the largest numbers because that allowed them to dump more stuff. In, in other words, necessity reigned supreme. Allied governments had big disposal problems, so they made policies that took advantage of gray areas and uncertainty in scientific investigations on the environmental impact, and there were numerous scientific investigations. Officials also believed that if they regulated the quantities and locations and the frequency of dumping, then the total amount that was sunk over time did not matter because the water would dissolve and disperse the pollution in between each operation. As a result, dumping became a standard procedure that continued until the 1970s when the London Convention prohibited the practice. But by then, millions upon millions of tons of conventional and chemical munitions were jettisoned into almost every major body of water. From the Baltic Sea to the Great Lakes, underwater munitions, as they are called now, are still there, corroding away, releasing their contents into marine environments. Scientists remain divided, or at the very least unsure, about the long-term microscopic dangers of chronic exposure and the slow violence associated with bioaccumulation in food webs. However, underwater munitions and their constituents, like white phosphorus, seen in the top left of the slide, represent a significant energetic threat to fishermen, beachgoers, construction workers, and harbor employees, while the wider economic impacts can be substantial, dump sites block the construction of oil pipelines, wind farms, and transportation infrastructure, and they force fishermen to destroy harvests when they're caught in nets. And they also shut down ports, beaches, and other tourist sites when discovered nearby. And so to conclude, the war junk of past conflicts has a long and dynamic afterlife. When hostilities end, the objects accumulated to fight are often the only things available for relief, reconstruction, and rehabilitation. So the suddenly unneeded weapons of war traverse a disposal process that reshapes values, forms, functions, and meanings according to the needs of peace. What governments and militaries considered as trash could be incredibly valuable to thrifty civilians caught in a turbulent post-war transition characterized by severe material shortages. The history of war junk is surprising because its materiality has a long and dynamic afterlife. And I hope that you'll all consider buying a book to learn more about that dynamic afterlife of munitions disposal and its connections to post-war reconstruction in Canada.
And again, for those of you that are interested in purchasing a copy, you can go directly to UBC Press's website and type in the discount code JUNK20 for a 20% off uh, of the uh, paperback price. And that, of course, is valid for the next few days till November 30th. Thank you very much, and I look forward to all of your questions. Thank you so much, Alex. That was excellent. Um, yeah, I, I learned a lot. I, I, we do have a few questions uh, that excellent. I put to you. Um, one is, um, how are the munitions being disposed of now? Are there munitions that they have are there, that are surplus, and uh, how do they dispose of them now? Um, so, fortunately, because of uh, international agreements in the 1970s and uh, the national laws that Canada had to come up with after signing those those uh, treaties, um, the dumping of munitions at sea is it can only take place under very emergency and significant uh, uh, situations, like to avoid a disaster. Um, so, uh, there are some really scrupulous characteristics and things that need to. Uh, 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 be met in order to have that happen. So, fortunately, there are some safeguards in that regard. Uh, today, most likely munitions are destroyed through a variety of new technologies that are emerging. And so, um, largely out of the end of the Cold War and the need to disarm a whole series of, uh, of installations and other things across the world, uh, the private sector has come along with a lot of new and innovative techniques. Um, you know, they've improved filtration technologies for incineration and a few other things like that. So, uh, munitions are destroyed generally on land now uh, through um, uh, detonations, incineration, scrapping, and other things like that uh, in, in a controlled environment. Uh, but quite often when they discover a munition that's in a sort of dangerous location, that's like in the water at a near a tourist beach, for example, uh, sometimes it's not safe to uh, destroy the, the munition on land or move it. So they'll just blow it up in place. Um, there are some people that don't think that's a good idea. Uh, I, I personally am on the fence, like in the sense that if they can move it, then move it. But if they can, it's gonna endanger the, the, the EOD technique going out to do the, the destruction, then by all means, blow it up on site. Um, but uh, there's some issues uh, surrounding that in, in terms of how it, it spreads potentially the, the carcinogens and explosive materials over a wider area than would have otherwise existed if we just left it where it was. Uh, and there's also some in, uh, interesting arguments because they have to put more explosives into the water to make the bomb go off. They're actually adding more into the water to, to do that. And then you're looking at, at potentially killing fish and other types of, of, of uh, uh, animals and, and wildlife that are in the area that we might not necessarily know about. Um, so there, it's, it's uh, let's say there's, there's a variety of alternatives. A lot of them are the same, but they've been improved on dramatically because of technology. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, what happened to the Axis powers junk after the war? Did they get to reuse it or was it uh, uh, captured and reused by the allies? And if there was, was there any favoritism towards reusing allied powers junk or Axis power junk? That's a good question. So, um, generally speaking, the, the, the allied authorities were quite uh, uh, nervous about uh, the presence of so much material that, um, you know, the, the Japanese and Germans had uh, spent years training with. Uh, so that they were worried about subversive elements and, and uh, getting a hold of these things and, and causing a lot of trouble for occupational security. So the goal was to disarm the enemy as quickly as possible. And in order to do that, you had to take control of as many military assets as possible and then destroy them through some capacity. And ocean dumping offered them a means to liquidate bulk quantities. Uh, so the, the push to retain um, military technologies by uh, the allies of the enemy was only really geared for scientific or memorial purposes uh, or um, for like souvenir type of items. Uh, there was a, a interest in terms of learning the technical backgrounds of a lot of these weapon systems and improving allied technology. So there is actually quite an interesting story about that. It's something I didn't really get into in my book. I was more concerned about the stuff that they get rid of, the garbage of, of war. Uh, and there is a lot of it because they're worried about occupational security. So, for example, in Japan, it's, it's actually a really serious issue uh, because uh, the Allies didn't invade. Uh, 
So there had been no battle uh, fought on Japanese home soil, and the Japanese had been holding back tremendous quantities of military assets to fight that battle, right? They were expecting Operation Olympic and Operation Coronet to take place in November of 1945, which, of course, the, the atomic bombs negated uh, the need to do that. Um, but the point is, is that there was so much material left over with, with a, an enemy that had proven that surrender was not uh, in their vocabulary. Uh, so this idea was to we need to get rid of it as quickly as possible. They de they ended up dumping like 4,500 tons a day uh, throughout most of the end of 1945 and into 1946 just to secure occupational supremacy. Wow. Uh, that's impressive. Um, mm -hmm. Next next question we have is um, what were the war claims that were met by selling motorbikes to the Dutch? That's a good question. So I get that question a lot from uh, uh, people because it's it's uh, one of the stories that uh, I tell in the book that's um, not told in many places, and it's always one of those things that's been a little confusing for people because everybody has heard of of the financial treaties that happened at the end of the war, right? Uh, the idea that uh, Britain was going bankrupt, so we had to loan the money uh, to to keep the 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 transatlantic economy in operation, and uh, it's very Keynesian in its economic theory that like priming the pump, we loan the money, and they buy our production, and so it's like money with strings attached. And those treaties take up all the attention. The newspapers talk about them. The academics have talked about them. The, it is the storyline coming out of the war from a sort of financial economic perspective. But one of the the, the sideline stories in that, and, and it's sort of subtly made in the uh, agreement, was that in order for those prompt priming loans to exist, they could not be used to purchase old technology, old production, that all of these loans were forward thinking that they had to be used specifically for new production that was going to be started and created in the post-war period. And so what do you do with all the old stuff, right? These loans are all for future production. So they had to come up with a separate set of agreements that dealt with the old production. And what they decided to do was tie that old production to war claims settlements. And so war claims settlements are essentially reparations between allies. So if your troops show up in Britain, they need a place to stay, which means that somebody has to rent that space. Somebody has to pay a per head capita rate or it's a per capita rate is what they were uh, 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 essentially funneling through the back channels of, of international diplomacy. And Canada was paying a per capita rate for access to British supply channels throughout the war until 1944. When we were fighting on the continent, drawing more supplies, Britain wanted to renegotiate and Canada wasn't interested. So they agreed to just settle it after the war. And so war claims are all a whole series of debts that accumulate uh, throughout the course of the fighting that uh, belligerent powers that are allies say, OK, well, we'll settle this after the fact. There is agreements that settle the British Commonwealth air training program and a whole series of other claims involving the Alaska Highway in the United States. And there's also a very important settlement that takes place with the Dutch, because when the war ends, Canada's army is in the Netherlands. And so what we, uh, uh, in, in the process of negotiating, we determined uh, uh, through the, the Dutch representation that Canada owed the Dutch $33 million for the costs of occupation. So the billeting of troops, the renting of space, destruction attributed to off-duty personnel, all that sort of stuff. And the Dutch were looking at that at that income as a way of helping them rebuild their economy like it was a, a, an important thing, important source of income for them. Um, but what Canada decides to do is uh, utilize that $33 million and pay it in kind. They left behind all of the military surpluses that were in the Netherlands. They accounted for about $25 million of that price tag. And then Canada cancels Dutch payments on the other $8 million for new production in Canada. And that's how we settled claims. And that saved Canada the cost of repatriating assets that we didn't really need in the first place. So it was like a win-win for everybody. And, and uh, as I point out in the book, uh, uh, military surpluses become these pawns of peacemaking between allies because we essentially paid debts by uh, lump sum payments for uh, an exchange of title. 
on all the assets that may or may not have been uh, inside the, the territorial limits of, of, of that uh, negotiating partner. partner. So again, it's, it's a really, really great question, a lot to unpack there. And I would argue that if there's a, a, another student or someone watching uh, uh, here, that that is a, 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 a discussion or that is a, an area of uh, the, the history of the ending of the end of the war that needs to be discussed more uh, con concretely and certainly needs a, a, a sustained scholarly analysis because not only are there reparations exchanged between allied governments, but there's also potentially reparations exchanged between governments and the people. So if you had war damage or if your property was expropriated because of, uh, of the war necessity, because of the War Measures Act, there, there was an avenue for you to, to complain to the government and request uh, some type of compensation. Were the Dutch okay with getting um, paid off in kind uh, or would they rather have had the money? Uh, they, they desperately needed military equipment. Uh, not only to to create a police force inside the Netherlands to maintain their territorial integrity and their defenses, but um, the Dutch were facing a very significant uh, uh, revolt against their rule in Indonesia. Uh, and so uh, actually one division uh, out of the three that the Dutch end up sending to Indonesia to fight in the late 1940s uh, is equipped entirely with Canadian uh, uh, surplus materials. So the Dutch are actually very excited to get it. They, they are on Canada right away to negotiate uh, a, a settlement. Uh, the, the earliest paperwork I saw was in the summer, uh, June, July, August, 1945. So they are right there as soon as the war is over. Okay. Um, next question is, um, what happened to the massive number of, of artillery pieces left over after the First World War? Um, well, uh, so the, uh, after the First World War, uh, the, the process is uh, uh, essentially passed over to the British. Uh, Canada relinquishes a lot of its control over assets, uh, mainly because a lot of them were British owned. Uh, and then uh, we brought home a significant amount of artillery pieces and, and material because uh, the military was hoping to maintain a very strong uh, uh, post-war military. Unfortunately, that's not what ends up happening. So a lot of these uh, World War One mat uh, uh, materiel uh, ends up sitting in in uh, abandoned in, in uh, warehouses. Uh, it degrades in in terms of their technology. Right, new technologies surpass them. Uh, when the war originally starts, actually Canada is training with eight, 1918 variant uh, uh, equipment. Uh, but as the war progresses and metal shortages start to prop up, a lot of that materiel is actually uh, melted down to make new weapons for the new war. Okay, great. Um, another question. Um, you said there was some uh, disposal in the Great Lakes. Where and what was the disposal? The... Uh, yeah, um, so documentation is very limited. Uh, it's been a very, very difficult time getting uh, a hold of, of information on this, but I've recently just found a series of 14 photographs of a dumping operation that took place out of Owen Sound uh, in, in November of 1945, and the, the photographs are amazing. Uh, I, I wonder if I could uh, uh, pull up one of them here and, and share my screen with you just so you can see it. Um, it's a, a very, very, very chilling uh, story about a disposal that takes place in uh, the Georgian Bay. And the army is in charge of the uh, dumping operation that takes place because uh, the Navy uh, isn't necessarily equipped to deal with it. And they dump uh, about a thousand tons in Dyer Bay. And uh, it's a significant situation because it doesn't appear on most government uh, uh, polluted sites. It doesn't appear on a lot of their uh, radar screens for testing and monitoring. Uh, and that's quite significant. Uh, on top of that, you're looking at a lot of uh, training uh, bases and uh, material uh, uh, that is um, essentially established in uh, the area of um, the, the, the Great Lakes in terms of like training for aircraft and planes and all of the uh, other um, uh, subjects, I guess you could say, is, is uh, they're all taking place in in and around the Ontario uh, uh, Quebec uh, a place where where the highly amount of population is. So a lot of training takes place there, and as a result, they need you know 
places to bomb. They need to shoot their artillery at something. And you're looking at a lot of unexploded ordnance that originates that as populations increase um, more and more land gets put into production. Well, unfortunately, you're, you're looking at finding a lot more ordnance uh, around the place. And in order to uh, uh, streamline disposal, uh, what they would do, uh, the R RCMP uh, or the military would go around, collect the uh, ordnance, pile it up in a location, and then when it was significant enough, they would put it on a barge and bring it out somewhere in Lake Ontario and dump it. Um, so there's actually quite a, a story about the Great Lakes that I'm only starting to really look into and get uh, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a bigger amount of information about, but it's really surprising how little it is uh, available on that subject. And I'm looking, I can't seem to find a copy of the picture. I think I only have it online. Uh, so, sorry, I can't, I can't draw it up right now, but it's a, it's a, uh, one of the only pictures I've ever seen of uh, munitions dumping in Canada. I, I actually just saw a show on TV Ontario about um, munitions being fired into the St. Lawrence in Eastern Quebec. Yeah, uh, that uh, they were trying to dig out some of the ordnance that was polluting the marshes. So yeah, that, which, which that, that's a, uh, likely in Nicolette near Nicolette, Qu Quebec. And uh, there's actually a really sad story in 1982 uh, during the Saint Jean Baptiste Day celebrations. A whole bunch of teenagers are out on the shores of the beach. They're all celebrating, and one of the the teenagers uh, picks up what he thought was driftwood. And well, just threw it on the fire and it didn't take very long uh, for what was an artillery shell to get heated enough for the TNT to explode. It killed him and nine and injured nine others. Uh, so th this is a serious issue and, and uh, definitely needs a lot more attention. Yeah, yeah they, they told that story too. That's yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think we've got one more question. Um, what lessons have we learned today to recycle, reuse, or minimize the environmental issues for munitions and other military items? And uh, this would apply to wars, peacetime, and deterrent products. Hmm. Oh, what lessons have we learned? Well, I think that there is a, a, a lesson, or at least there's a spin-off lesson, in the sense that in order to like disarm, you know, chemical weapons and in order to disarm nuclear weapons and some of the larger, uh, uh, more dangerous weapon systems, um, there had to be a sort of push towards the end of the Cold War to actually set up facilities and create technologies to do that. And as a result, you're looking at, at quite a lot of improvements in filtration and uh, incineration techniques which has a potential to help us uh, create energy out of our garbage. A lot of people think of burning garbage as being a really bad and polluting thing, but if you can filter the smoke and filter the, the outcome, that heat that you can generate from burning garbage can actually power generators. They do this in other countries. And I would argue that there's a strong connection between the uh, uh, necessity of disarming and the spin-off technologies that that provides. So I think that there are some like lessons there. Um, as far as, as us today, I, I think uh, we need to pay more attention to how thrifty and resourceful people were in the past, because this material opulence that, that's surrounded in us all the time in every way, shape or form, um, has, it, it's not a norm. It, it hasn't been around for very long. And uh, we need to understand that. We need to be more conscious of, of our surroundings and the amount of materials that we put into them, because we have to remember that the things that we, um, you know, no longer require, uh, it has a life cycle, right? The stuff that we, that garbage we put at the end of the curb every, every week, uh, that, that has an environmental output, that has a, an impact that, that lasts long after it, it leaves our possession. And we need to be conscious of that and make choices when we're purchasing things. And, uh, you know, deciding whether or not uh, that single use item is worth it or whether or not there might be a more expensive option, but something that you can maybe reuse and make more, get more use out of uh, over the long haul. And so I think people need to, uh, to really understand thriftiness and understand the sort of histories that are uh, embedded into those processes a little bit better. And hopefully war junk is a, is a, a first step in that regard. Well, thank, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I just wanna, I wanna thank you for a really interesting and, and really thought provoking talk. Uh, I was always wondering why um, after the war, every farmer wasn't driving a, a army truck and every woman wasn't driving to the grocery store in a Jeep. But yeah. now you've answered some of those questions. 
Um, so uh, I just want to remind our audience that uh, this talk has been recorded and it's going to be posted on uh, Guelph Museum's website. Uh, and if you're interested in purchasing Alex's book, War Junk Munitions Disposal and Post-War post Reconstruction in Canada, um, you can see the information to get it here uh, at UBC Press. Um, I also want to let uh, our people in Guelph know that uh, at Guelph Museums, we are open to the public uh, for visit visitors. We, uh, we um, encourage you to book ahead for that online. We do have two new exhibits on uh, the Second World War. Uh, one is uh, Soldier, Scholar, Spy, which is on the, the bit about the story of John Kenneth McAllister, who was a Guelphite who died at Buchenwald after being um, uh, dropped in uh, to help with the French underground. So a really interesting story there. And another story on uh, the liberation of Holland, 75 years since the end of the Second World War. And that um, story highlight is highlighted by a uh, uh, bit of information on Trooper Clarence Oliver James. So a couple of interesting new new exhibits on the Second World War that we're highlighting. Um, and I also want to let people know that this is our last military lecture uh, of 2020. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the, the talks this year. Uh, even though they're virtual, it'd be much nicer to have Alex here in person and take him out for a beer afterwards. Uh, but uh, we really enjoyed having you speak tonight, Alex. Uh, we plan on continuing these military lectures in January of 2021, and we will have the, the speakers posted on our website uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, and so on my, behalf of myself uh, and the staff of Guelph Museums, we wish everyone a uh, happy and safe holiday season, and we look ho uh, forward to having everyone back with us in 2021. So thanks a lot for joining us tonight. And thank you for coming and thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alex.